Yeah. I'm the middle school principal at Park, and uh, this is my 21st year at Park School. I was a Spanish teacher and a boys basketball coach before, and then it's my third year as the principal, so it's, uh, so far so good. It's a great place. But in the summer, uh, I've been leading cultural walking tours in Spain, and I've been doing that since 1993. And so I've been to Spain, I think, probably the 20, last 25 summers, and I go every year. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I guide students, sometimes I guide adults, but uh, so I spend a lot of time, and mostly in, in southern Spain, in Andalusia, where a lot of this sort of history and tradition exi um, ex exists, and it lives and breathes right there on the street. So what I'd like to do for the next half an hour is talk about uh, the, in the influence of Muslim Spain, when I say Muslim Spain, I'm really talking about 7-Eleven 1492. Talk about the impact of Muslim Spain on our current culture. Um, a lot of the things that we do and that we're used to doing come right out of Muslim Spain from those 700 years. And then I also want to talk about what was the end of that era, and really 1492 was the end of that era, and what led up to 1492 and exactly how all of the players, um, political players, interacted with each other. So. If, uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about, and if you imagine I'd be doing something else, don't feel bad. I won't feel bad if you get up and feel you got to Okay. So um, this is Europe, right? This is where um, this is what we're talking about. This is Spain down here in the southwest corner. It shares the Iberian Peninsula with Portugal, and what's really important to note is its proximity to Africa, northern Africa, so Morocco and Algeria, um, and right there in between Spain and Africa, there is. Uh, does anyone know what this body of water here is called in between Spain and Africa? Right, those are the Straits of Gibraltar, and there actually is a, a, a rock, it's an island, in between those two. They call that the Rock of Gibraltar. You've seen the Rock of Gibraltar, it's the logo for Prudential, but that, that really is what it looks like. Um, and, and I've been there, and, and, and so anyone that moves from northern Africa, and so Berber tribes, or what we in the Moors or Muslims, as they move through um, onto the Iberian Peninsula, it was a very short distance for the most part. Um, current day Spain, uh, this is what it looks like, it's, it's made up of 17 autonomias and, and 50 provincias. The autonomias would be like our states, right, and their provincias are like their counties. And so Andalusia, or Al Andalus, the land, uh, the, the, the area that we're really going to talk about it, you know, you can see that the different counties inside, it's got Granada, Cordoba, Sevilla, um, etc. So when, when I say, you know, what, do you, what comes to mind when you think of Spain or someone says, oh, we're going, uh, we're going to spend two weeks in Spain, what are the, some of the things that you think of immediately? Flamenco. Paella. Paella. Sangria. Right. Okay. So these are, these are the things that come to mind when you think of Spain. The flamenco, the bullfighting, tapas, which has been a bit uh, a rage here in the States for the last 15 years, royal palaces and beaches. Um, Spanish culture and, for the most part, Spanish language has had an amazing impact on, on us. These are words that all come from the Spanish. Um, a lot of these, you can see, come, you know, rodeo and salsa and suave, clearly those come from Spanish, but a lot of these other words that we use all of the time have come to us from, um, from Spanish. But what we might not realize is how many Spanish words uh, that we use all of the time actually came from the Arabic first. They came from the Arabic before they came from the Spanish. So here's just a few examples of words that we use all of the time. They come from the al. So the word for jar, or, or, or in Spanish, is jarra, but it comes from jarra, which was the, is the Arabic. Alcohol comes from alcohol, which was also the Arabic. The Spanish is alcohol. Algebra, which is what it is in Spanish, aljabra, and um, cotton, algodón, alcutún, and then alcatraz, the name of the <laughs> island, which really means sea eagle. Al so um, these are just some words, but there are also a lot of cultural traditions, things that we uh, take for granted, and we don't know why we do them, but we do do them, and they came right out of this era, um, what I'll call um, the Golden Age of Spain. Now, the Golden Age of Spain was really 711 to 1010. Um, after that, from 1010 to 1492, there were really distinct factions, um, and, and it wasn't necessarily a peaceful time. When we think of the Golden Age, hi, come on in, welcome. Uh, we're really talking about the earlier part of this, but some of the contributions of Muslim Spain, first of all, are algebra, right, which was um, al Khwarizmi in the year 820, um, the first practicing um, of, the, of the scientific method. Lots of fruits and vegetables that we have and that we love. Now, these weren't um, born in, in, in uh, Muslim Spain. 
lot of these came through trade routes from the east. And so across the trade routes, through northern Africa, up through the Straits of Gibraltar. And none of these foods, so we have rice, apricots, peaches, and oranges, were even available in Europe until they came up through Spain and through the markets. The silk uh, industry did not, uh, didn't bloom up in uh, the Netherlands until it came from the Muslims in Spain from the Straits of Gibraltar. This is, uh, do you know, anyone know what silk, what kind of trees? Silkworms, mulberry trees, right? So the cultivation of the silk, of the silkworms and the pods and the trees themselves. Um, so uh, in the year 822, there was a man that worked for the Sultan in Cordoba. His name was Zidiab. He was the Versace of Spain. And um, Cordoba, so Cordoba, Sevilla, Granada are the three most important cities in the south. And Cordoba was one of the most powerful. It was known as the Caliphate of, of Pleasure. Um, and, and hopefully I'll be able to talk a little bit about the distinctions between um, so Shiites and Sunnis and their orientation towards Islam. But uh, southern Spain was a very peaceful, uh, a peaceful, warm place. The weather was always good. The trees were full of fruit. The rivers teeming with fish. The sky was always blue. So it was, very, it was a place where you um, uh, really could enjoy life. But also because of where it was in the trade routes, the market was booming. And so people had money. And when people have money, then they tend to be happy and they can actually spend some of their time and money on the arts. And so Ziryab, what he suggested to the Sultan was, you should change your clothing. And in the summer, you should wear cottons and linens and things that are uh, white and cream colored. And in the winter, you should wear furs and the darker, darker um, uh, dark browns and blacks. And then in the spring, you should wear bright colors and reds and oranges. Before, you wore the same clothing all year round, but now with, the, with, with, with um, the access to spices and, th and uh, uh, things that could change the color of textiles, they could change exactly what the dress was that they wore. And so this notion of style, of changing what you wear to, according to the season, was really born in the ninth century in Spain. Um, also born um, uh, or made popular through sort of Muslims in Spain was the al aud which was literally known as the, the wood, but this is what the lutes, right? So it was really designed in Persia, but again, these instruments brought through the trade routes into southern Spain and then up eventually into um, into the rest of Europe. This is the predecessor to what an important instrument here in the United States and the world is the guitar, right? So also um, the introduction of crystal and of glass um, by Muslim chemists and engineers in 9th century Spain. So this is the transformation of the art of entertaining. and. Um, all of a sudden, aesthetics became very, very important. It wasn't just put all of the food on the table, but it was what the table looks like. The idea of putting candles on the table and wine in a crystal glass so that the, the reflection of the wine through the crystal uh, made, the, made the room beautiful. It's really, um, so uh, um, after the death of Mohammed, there were really four, um, four men that took over after him, the four caliphs. The caliph is a religious and a spiritual and a political leader all wrapped up into one. So after the death of Muhammad, this is in six, I don't know, someone how many, 25, 630, something around that time. So after he dies, there were four um, blood relatives that took over for the prophet. After that fourth caliph died, there was this uh, rift between who should, be the, who should be the leader. Some said, in order to be the voice of Islam, you have to be blood relative of Muhammad or, or, or son-in-law, as some of those caliphs were. But there was another sect that said, no, it's the spirit. It's, the, it's, it's, what he, it's what he practiced in his heart. It's what is the spirit of the Quran. And there was a big rift between these two. So the, the, the group that seized the most power were what today we think of as the Sunnis. That's the, those are the group that believes in the spirit of the law, the spirit of the Quran. The Shiites more about the blood lineage. So everything that is um, the... the so after this split, then there was a takeover about 110 years later by the Shiites. So this was the a believing in the bloodline. And what they did was they hunted down every member of the Sunnis, and only one escaped. And his name was Abdurrahman. He fled to northern Africa. His mother was a Berber. And there he crossed the Straits of Gibraltar into Spain. He was a believer in the spirit of the law. So of course, when he saw something that was beautiful, he accepted it. And it was very easy for him to spread his word because he spoke um, Arabic, which is a very lyrical language. If there's a lot of it's, po it's poetic, you can sing it. And people thought, "Wow, who is this? Um, who is this? Uh, who's this guy who brings this language and this art? And he's also a warrior." And so, anything that we talk about in Spain, um, the uh, the uh, Omayas, the uh, Omayas, which were hunted by the, 
by the Almoravids, those were the ones that were um, believed in sort of the bloodline. When he came to Spain, it was an openness, an openness to art, an openness to what was beautiful, and so this um, um, this kin kinship with uh, the aesthetics and anything is beautiful, that is what represents, that's the hallmark of Muslim Spain, okay? And so, um, not only do we talk about things that are beautiful, but things that are also practical. So when you go into a supermarket and you know exactly what <coughs> aisle you're looking for, this is also, again, right out of Muslim Spain. So in Cordoba, the market was huge. Thousands and thousands of vendors. It would have been impossible to find what you were looking for. And so the Sultan said, if you're going to be, if you're going to sell goods in our market, you have to join a guild. And if you join a guild, you have to put your wares in a particular part of the market. So if you sell milk products, they all have to be in one place. If you're going to sell textiles, they all have to be in another place. And the Sultan would send uh, would send uh, people into the market and they would check. They'd unwrap the bag of figs to make sure that the ones on the bottom weren't spoiled. Or they would check the milk to make sure that it wasn't watered down. And if it was, the entire guild um, would be fine. And so there was this amazing quality control in the market. And the market itself was huge. So we, I mean, we have this idea now. We walk into a supermarket and we know, well, I'm, I'm going to find my cookies in aisle 7 and my cereal in aisle 6. And it's all because of, of such a huge market in Cordoba. And you can, you can imagine with the trade routes how huge it must have been. <laughs> Sunglasses. Uh, cataract surgery in 1155 by Al Gafaki. This is a statue um, that's that's in current day Cordoba in southern Spain. Um, and, and in Spanish, the word for glasses are gafas, so named after Al Gafaki. Something else that Ziriab introduced was this notion of putting a, a white tablecloth or any tablecloth over a heavy wooden um, table. He said, "Let's make it. Let's make the experience beautiful." So the crystal glasses. Let's put the, can, uh, the candles on the table. Instead of this big wooden slab, let's cover it with something beautiful, right? Uh, he also said, let's play uh, music. Let's put music in the background so that people enjoy that experience. Uh, also, are, anyone know what this is? That's gazpacho, right, which comes from the Arabic word. But um, uh, up until this point, food, when you, when you ate a huge banquet, all the food we put on the table at the same time, and then you could either mill around the table, or you could sit and you'd have to sort of fight for it. But it was Ziyab that said, "Why don't we serve the food in courses? Let's break it down. Let's slow down the meal. People will pay attention to the music. People will pay attention to how beautiful the room is and the company. We'll start with a cold soup, right, or a gazpacho. We'll move into the next round, which will be meat or fish." and then we'll finish it up with a pastry or, uh, or an almond cookie or something like that. So to spread the meal out. Also, something that we take for granted, I mean, all of our dining and shopping experiences come right out of southern Spain. So I, I, I use this term, moros or moors, but it's really important to remember that this was not one group of people. For, you know, for almost for 500 years, successive waves of invaders were coming and they were all distinct, different family clans, different tribes. What happened when the, when the first groups got to Spain? After 25 or 30 years, they were, they were soft. I mean, it, it, was, it was so beautiful. And, um, and, 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 and a land that was rich and plentiful and vibrant, really after 25 or 30 years, the next wave of aggressors came from the desert. And they were hungry, they were thirsty, and they conquered very easily. And then within 25 or 30 years, they again became complacent until the next wave of invaders. We call all of those waves of invaders the Moors. Um, so what was the situation? So um, Abdurrahman crossed the Straits of Gibraltar in 711, and in 100 years, the entire Iberian Peninsula was conquered. 100 years. It's like That's like light speed, if you consider how much. Now, before Abdurrahman arrived, it was, it was Visigothic Spain, so that's very early Christian Spain. Um, not yet Catholicism, right, but early believers in Christianity. Um, and they conquered all the way up to the north. They even started into certain parts of Spain. And then the, what we call, and so that was, we call that the conquest of Spain. And then the Christian began a reconquest back down towards the south. By 1030, they had reached a couple of key cities. By 1200, you can see that almost half of the peninsula had been reconquered. Okay, and then by 1490, all that is left, left is the kingdom of Granada. So you can imagine that if you, visit, if you visited Spain today and you went up to Asturias or Santander or Galicia up here in the north, what you would see of, of Muslim Spain would be very little. I mean, little if any at all. If you come to Granada, to Granada, Spain today, 
the whole entire city looks looks more looks Muslim. I mean, everywhere because this is seven hundred years of Muslim um, living, and then this was you know a few hundred, if that at all. So uh, let's talk about what what happened here in the Kingdom of Granada in 1492, um, because that was the that was officially the end of Muslim occupation. So just throw out at least two things that you know of that happened in 1492. Columbus, Columbus and the Spanish Inquisition, right? So those are the things that we know the most. Um, what, what's important to, to talk about, though, is the life of Fernando and Isabel. So Isabel with a Y was how she spelled it. They unified the four largest kingdoms in Spain. In fact, it wasn't called Spain until Fernando and Isabel got married. And that is when what we call Spain today was created. Before that, they were different kingdoms. Um, Christopher Columbus, his name was Colon. He was from Genoa, and uh, he searched for new routes to the Indies. We'll talk about that in a second. The Jews and the Muslims were exiled or forced to convert to Christianity. Uh, under Muslim rule, Jews and Christians were allowed to practice their religion. They were taxed to do that, but, um, but they, for the most part, they were deeply respected, and, um, and, and there were Jews, teach, Jews and Christians teaching in Muslim madrasas, or universities. Uh, and the Catholic monarchs, so when I say Catholic monarchs or Catholic kings, that's Fernando and Isabel. They captured the last more, more city of Granada. So uh, this is Fernando and Isabel. He was a military uh, leader. She was also a great military leader, but she, she also considered herself a visionary. They were devout Catholics. They married in 1469. All of these images that you see here are paintings, or this is, wood, this is a wooden carving from the Royal Chapel in Granada, Spain, which is where they are buried today. So uh, they, when they married, they, um, they believed that this was destiny, that this was God's destiny, and that they were meant to unify Spain, and they were meant to rid the country of the infidels. This is the coat of arms of Fernando and Isabel. They chose this as their main symbol, the, the eagle, the black eagle. Well, why the eagle? Well, of the four evangelists of the Christian Bible, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of them have a symbol that's the, for, for which they're identified. So it's a bull, it's a winged man, it's a, it's a, a lion, and, a, um, and an eagle. And so the, one of those evangelists, John, his symbol is the eagle. Some say because his writing is the clearest of the four. And so the clear is because he was the greatest visionary. So of course the Catholic kings thinking that they themselves were visionaries wanted to associate themselves with, with John. It's also, John. it's also true that both Fernando and Isabel's father's names were Juan. So there's this family connection and there's this religious connection with the, sim the symbol of the eagle. So you have the black eagle. Of course you have the corona, you have the crown. Um, and then you've got some, you've got these symbols in here. Does anyone know what the castles and the lions are? So that's Castilla and Leon. Those are two of the kingdoms that were unified when Fernando and Isabel married. The other ones are Navarra and Aragon. Those were the kingdoms of Fernando, Castilla and Leon and Isabel. When they married, um, they brought these together. You also see there's a quiver of arrows. So before the kings married, all of the kingdoms of Spain were, were different. They, were, they all had their own vision, their own um, goals to set, but once they married, they brought them together. So they unified Spain, and that's what this, these are symbols of a unified Spain. You also see a broken yoke. A yoke is what you put on the backs of a, an ox to, to pull a plow. They felt like the last 700 years of, that Spain had been ruled by the Muslims and the Jews, and they were breaking away from that past. So the broken, this is only half of a yoke, right? Otherwise, it would be both halves. The broken yoke, again, is a symbol of a new, a new future. Um, and then the last thing to point out, does anyone see something really interesting that I haven't mentioned? Yeah, so there's a pomegranate. Does anyone know why the pomegranate is one of the most important symbols of Fernando and Isabel? Okay, so we'll get that. Um, these were the four kingdoms, right? Castilla, Leon, Navarra, and Aragon. You can see that they unified all of Spain. Now, so how come they didn't unify this? Yeah, it was Muslim. They didn't, it wasn't theirs yet, right? It wasn't theirs yet. They were on their way. Um, this is the current coat of arms of Spain today. If you look at a Spanish flag or if you look at a, a Spanish coin, so they have the crown, they've got the castles and the lions. These are still the same four um, coats of arms of those four kingdoms united by Fernando and Isabel. Got the pomegranate. So we're definitely going to have to talk about the pomegranate, right? And then you've got the pillars of Hercules. So in the story of Hercules, 
that I actually I'm not as familiar with with the exact story, but I know that the pillars were the Rock of Gibraltar and the mainland Spain. That those were the pillars of Hercules, and up until the quote unquote discovery of the New World, that that was the end, and anything beyond those pillars was uh, was the next world or something that's inaccessible, but you would possibly fall off the edge of the world. So at the time, there was an expression, non plus ultra, there is nothing more out there. Of course, once, once Columbus discovered the, the new world, they, they realized there is actually more out there. So that's plus ultra, there's more out there. And, and in Spain, they're very proud of the fact that they were the ones that sponsored Columbus who um, hadn't gone out and discovered the new world. So these pillars are, are symbols of the discovery of the new world. And of course, in the story of Hercules, there was a banner around these two pillars. This is where our dollar sign comes from. It's these two pillars together with the banner around it. Okay, so that's where we get our dollar sign from. So Chris Columbus, uh, he, he was a smart man, but he wasn't as smart as the Portuguese. That's where he learned all of his navigation skills. He went to them first and they said, actually, your numbers are wrong. You're not gonna get to where you think you're gonna get. And he um, then went to Spain and they said, we love, we love the idea, we'll sponsor you. Um, of course, you can see, and there's, there, there are many famous paintings and depictions of Columbus's uh, landing. This is in San Salvador. I, what I find interesting is you've got the, you've got the flags of the Spanish kings right here, of um, Castilla and Leon. Again, another depiction of Columbus landing. Uh, this is the cathedral in, the, in Seville. It's the third largest cathedral in the world. It's, it's a football field wide and three football fields long. It's considered one of the most um, amazing museums in Spain just because of the artwork and the sculpture and paintings that are inside of it. But Columbus is buried inside the cathedral of, of Sevilla. So this is the tomb of Columbus in the cathedral of Seville. He said, I never want to be buried in Spanish soil. He wanted to be buried in the Americas. So, of course, he's not buried in Spanish soil. He's <laughs> above Spanish soil. And um, lots of arguments about where exactly his bones are. But DNA testing was done on these bones. And his son, Hernández Colón, lived in Sevilla, and they have that DNA. So they actually have been able to prove that some of what's in this box does belong to Christopher Columbus. It's an amazing um, <coughs> tomb because you've got the four pallbearers, and each of the four of them wear the different coats of arms of those four kingdoms, right? And You'll notice, um, you'll notice something interesting about this, is that the, the, the front two pallbearers have a lance in their hand, and the lance is stuck into something. What, what would you imagine that lance is stuck into? Pomegranate. Yes, a pomegranate. <laughs> it's stuck into a pomegranate. So why a pomegranate? I mean, why? Seeds. How do you, well, um, it's a good guess. What is the word for pomegranate in Spanish? I don't know. It's granada. Una granada. So a pomegranate is a granada. So um, why would the lance be stuck into a pomegranate, into a granada? Because the last city, the end of Muslim rule, was in Granada. That was a gr the granada is the symbol of the elimination of the Muslims and the Jews. Right. This was now the, the beginning of Catholic, um, the Catholic uh, um, domination. So back here we are to Granada, right? And, and this is the last, it, it's really a kingdom, but there's also a city in the kingdom called Granada. Impossible to talk about the city without seeing the city, because it is spectacular. It is, I'm, I've traveled all over Spain, and it is by far my, most, my, my favorite city. It, there is a castle on the hill, which is still the greatest um, preserved medieval structure in all of Europe. The Alhambra Palace, which sits up on the hill behind it, and you can't see here are the snow-capped Sierra Nevada mountains. There's snow tw uh, 12 months out of the year. And then it, there's a hill that curves down, and then there's a river called the Darro River, and then another hill where the city of Granada is. So from the city, you can see the palace. And from up in the palace, you can see the city. And behind, you have mountains covered in snow. Um, this is in the Alhambra Palace. How many of you have been to the Alhambra? Right, so amazing. This is the courtyard of the lions. Um, some believe that this fountain was a gift of the Jewish kings. It's got 12 lions, symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel, and then with each hour, different water spouts out of a different lion's head. There's, there's, there's water, there's flowers that bloom in 12, uh, 12 months of the year. Um, and, and the city itself is spectacular. And, and, and some people say that maybe the city is called Granada because the, from the heights of the Alhambra, looking out into the city, it looks like a pomegranate cut open because it's all of these 
courtyards with red red tile roofs, and it, and it looks like the fruit cut open. And, and there's other there's other legends, of course. But so Granada wasn't just a gorgeous, spectacular paradise of a city. This was the home of Muslim learning. The madrasa was famous, um, incredible translations. So much of what ex that we have today only exists because of the universities in Granada and that this work was preserved and then eventually moved up into Europe before much of it was burned here in Spain. So culturally, intellectually, and aesthetically, th this to lose Granada would be more than just losing a military city, right? There's a, there's a great expression, um, and, uh, and you can buy this on like, of course, ashtrays and t-shirts. It says, Dale limosna mujer que no hay nada como la pena de ser ciego en Granada. Right, it's a, it's a blind man uh, begging in the streets, and uh, a, a husband and wife walk down the street, and they see the blind man, and she says, give him alms, the man says, give him alms, for there's no pain in life more profound than a blind man in Granada. Right, because it, it just to miss it, to miss it. Um, so, um, how did Granada fall? What happened here in 1492? So, it, it really was uh, about this man. His name was Boabdil. He was the last Sultan of Granada. But to truly understand the story, you have to know who his father was, because uh, this wasn't just something that happened. Um, that was not his father. <laughs> his father was Muley Hassan, and uh, he he was very very powerful. Uh, he made the mistake of uh, taking for himself a Christian princess. He also had a Muslim wife, way many Muslim wives, but her name was Isabella Solis, and the Muslims called her Zoraya, and she gave birth to a son. And as soon as she gave birth to a Christian son, it, it created problems for his first Muslim wife, Aisha, who also had, uh, and she, so she was the Sultana. She also had a son named Boabdil, and now we have two sons, a Muslim son and a Christian son. And uh, what you have to understand is that Hassan, he knew that the Catholic kings had all of the uh, peninsula taken over. And so he was really vassal. He was paying taxes, a lot of that in silks, to the Catholic kings to let him be, right? And, um, and, and she knew that all it would take is this Christian son to take the throne, and then it was a matter of just the Catholic kings moving in. And so she went to the Meshwar, which was the Sultan's council, and she said, this is a threat. Granada is not a city that we can simply turn over. If anything, we will battle, but we don't ever want to lose it. I think that Hassan, I don't think he's fit to rule. And they said, but who, who's going to rule? And she said, my son, Bob Deal. And they said, but he's just, he's just a kid. He's 18, he's never been to battle, he doesn't negotiate. And she said, I, I will make all of the decisions, he will be the figurehead. Don't worry about it. And so they said, fine. And as soon as Hassan returned, he was on a hunting trip, he was exiled to Malaga, where his brother was put on the throne, but really he was just a puppet for the Catholic kings. Um, and Boabdil took the throne with his mother, Aisha, uh, really in, in control, really making all of the decisions um, f f from that point onward. Uh, once he took the, the throne, Aisha said, no more payments to Fernando Nusabel. We are independent kingdom. And as soon as they declared independent kingdom, the Catholic kings decided we are now going to attack Granada. And they launched a siege from Santa Fe, which is a town just outside of the city. When I say launch a siege, they started to they started bringing in troops, right? And they thought, well, what we'll do is we will starve out the city. Of course, you couldn't starve out the Alhambra because it had running water and it had thousands of acres of, or uh, of orchards. Um, the city itself, however, possibly could have been starved out. So the armies are starting to move in, and Bob Deal made a fatal mistake. Um, he left the, the walls of the Alhambra Palace. He walked into the city. He wanted to get a closer look at the troops. And so as he was in the city, a couple of Fernando Nisabel soldiers saw him and captured him. He became um, a, a, a prisoner of the Catholic kings out there in Santa Fe. They starved him for a few days, and then they said, we'll make you a deal. You give us the Alhambra and, the, and Granada, and we will spare your life. And at that point, he said, fine, I'll do it. <laughs> Once he returned to the Alhambra Palace, and his mother said, where have you been? He said, I've been with Fernando Isabel. And she said, and what, and, and what of it? And he said, I've agreed to surrender. I've agreed to all of the terms of the surrender of both the Alhambra and Granada. And she was livid. This is exactly what she had planned um, would not happen. And he had gone and made this foolish mistake. Nonetheless, the, the, the surrender of Granada was planned for January 2nd. This is a painting that hangs in the royal chapel where Fernando and Isabel are buried in Granada. You can see the Alhambra there on the hill. 
This is Bo Abdil, painted to look a little bit older than he probably was. Fernando and Isabel, he's holding a key in his hand, symbolic keys to the city. Um, at that point, Muslims and Jews were given a choice. They could leave Granada or they could stay. Uh, those that stayed within 25, 30 years were completely subjected to the laws of the Inquisition. They were either murdered, murdered or they were converted. But anyone at that time that wanted to leave could head into the Sierra Nevada. So the southern ridge of the, of the Sierra Nevada, which is on the sea side, the Mediterranean side of the Sierra Nevada mountains to live. And so you can imagine this train of thousands and thousands of people leaving Granada after their families had been there for maybe 500, 600 years. Um, when they got to a mountain pass, and so one day you will all get to Granada, and, and as you leave the city and head towards the coast, you get to a pass where you look back and you can see the city, and as you move forward, you head towards the coast and you can no longer see it. And so the, the story goes that when he got to the mountain pass, he turned, and, and the, the sun had been setting, he saw the Alhambra, the palace on the, on the hilltop glistening with, the, with candles, you can see the city and the valley right next to it. And he thought about all of the things that we've talked about today, all of the influences of Muslim Spain, right, of, of Ziriab, and of the palaces in a um, running water, and, and 700 years of Muslim rule, and he knew it would end with him. That his legacy would be that he surrendered it, and that he didn't put up a fight. And at that point, he started to, he started to cry. His mother, on the horse beside him, saw him crying, and, and stepped off of her horse and scolded him. <laughs> I can't read the Arabic. <laughs> she said, and I tell the story in Spanish, Haces bien, Boabdil. Lloras como una mujer para una ciudad que no sabías defender como un hombre. She said, Boabdil, you do so well to cry like a woman over a city that you do not know how to defend like a man. So at that point, he let out a sigh. Uh, and they say that if you go to southern Spain and you and you head up into the Alpujarras, which is the southern ridge of the Sierra Nevada, and you listen very carefully, that if you that you could hear in the wind, you can still hear in the wind, the sigh of Boabdil, right? The last sultan of Granada. That's hard. Good.